afternoon, everybody. Happy Wednesday. I think today's Tuesday. Uh, different different match day for, for Norwich City. And it's a very momentous day. The news that we've all been waiting for, it feels like a bit of a lifetime. Me and Connor were just speaking off camera. It was sort of end of May where we broke the story that uh, Mark Atanasio was interested in purchasing some shares in Norwich City Football Club. And today we got the news that that, that has been confirmed. Um, he's also been appointed as the first overseas director on the Norwich City board as well. So it's a, a big day for uh, Norwich City, Connor, and obviously the match tonight as well. So it could be an even even bigger and better day for them. So uh, to start off the show, how do you sort of reflect on what's been a sort of very crazy four months, really? Yeah, mad. Um, you know, I, I kind of think back to sort of really uh, around when, when we first maybe got wind of the, uh, of the story. And from there, it's a real process of, of trying to identify things, um, speak to various people about maybe what is the case, what isn't the case. Uh, you know, there was obviously a fair bit of identification as well involved and uh, making sure that we got all of the, the various strands right. And, uh, you know, I, I read the original story again today and, um, you know, basically what we said then has transpired. A, a group of American investors led by Mark Atanasio were interested in investing in Norwich City. Well, that's exactly what has happened. It's just obviously taken a fair bit of time to get to, to that point, as probably we, we expected it would do, really. Um, and it's been interesting to hear some colour from Atanasio himself, but also from, from Delia Smith and Michael Wynne-Jones about their visit to Norwich and, uh, and Norfolk and England as well and uh, and what they felt and uh, and what sort of encouragement they took away from it and some of the processes involved so yeah it's been crazy I mean it was a bit like um it was a, it was a bit like a war room wasn't it at Arch and HQ on that on that Friday when, when we were trying to get it over the line and uh you know there's a there's a fair bit involved with these things before you can actually get a story like that out there so um yeah it's it's nice I think to sit here after the event because it's it's taken so much of our time over the last four months there's been a lot of stories and a lot of strands around it and I think we've been first to pretty much every stage um so yeah probably the news that we were expecting uh, ultimately um and it's a, as you say a momentum of stay for Norwich City Football Club it's the first time I think since what 2008 I think the Turners got involved with it so um the first time that there's been kind of fresh investment on on, on that regard but also this one is, is majorly different because we're seeing Michael Folger who's played his own role in Norwich City history in the last 25 years um, you know move on as, as will be the case at the end of the season from from kind of what we gather um, and a new overseas director who has had no involvement in, in English football in Norfolk um, life in, in England and whatever to take a place on the board and, and someone who happens to be extremely wealthy. So um, yeah, really, really interesting. And it's going to be really interesting to see how it transpires from here, I think, because this just to end, this feels like the beginning of something rather than probably the end of, uh, of a story. At the time we've got uh, Mr. Sam Seaman joining us as well. Um, Sam, you wrote a piece up regarding the, and what this means for Norwich City Football Club in, in the sense of what the shares that uh, Mark Atanasio has purchased, we sort of believe it's around about 16%, but topped up uh, with other stakes, by other, uh, you know, a few other stakes that he, he can purchase. So um, do you want to talk about the, the C preference shares as well to anyone that maybe doesn't understand what that is? <laughs> yes, it's going to be pretty difficult not to make any mistakes. But from what I understand, it's basically a set of shares um, which Atanasio is expected to purchase that then was effectively a loan because it will cost him ten million pounds to purchase all of them, and then um, in seven years, or upon the trigger of certain events, including um, the potential transfer of the majority shareholding, i.e., Delia and Michael selling their shares, um, that will be payable back to him as either a sixteen million pound return or ten percent of um, the club in in ordinary shares. So effectively, it means that. Um, Atanasio now can fund the club and can provide an investment which will hopefully aid them in the short term but it means also that in the long term if he's happy with the club and the way that things work um, he can top up potentially what, what his current shareholding is um, by by 10%. I don't know if Connor wants to add anything to that because he was the he was the main research man around that topic. No I think that's I think that's pretty much spot on yeah so, so it's, it's interesting because these this is a completely new share type Norwich City have, have only really had uh, a, a and B shares I think as, as I understand it um, a of course being ordinary ones um, so he's, he's obviously purchased some of those has a seat on the board but also has the C preference shares and the, the point around them as well is that they don't get voting rights so I if there was a club vote on a specific matter that wasn't involved with the C preference shares um, 
he technically wouldn't get a vote on it, but obviously now he's on the board, it kind of means he does anyway. Um, so, so that's an interesting element. And, and yeah, exa- exactly what Sam said, really. It's a, a 10 million sort of equity into the club, inje- cash injection into the club. And the benefit of that from the club side is that they get that cash instantly and it improves the books instantly. And obviously Atanasio gives it as a loan and has sort of a, 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 a 7%, I think off the top of my head, interest rate on that. So he gets kind of money uh, r- probably around 700 thousand a year in dividend payments so that, that acts as a little bit of a reward for him with obviously as Sam outlined the prospect of either turning that into um, ordinary shares 10 percent or um, or then being able to to make a return on his money essentially so it's kind of a win-win for all parties a try before you buy if you will uh, in terms of him increasing his shareholding um, and probably a, a practical route to him having a bigger say into the club in terms of the, or on top of the shares that he already has. So uh, it makes it probably worthwhile for all parties. Um, yeah, so it's a little bit complex and I know probably quite dry to some people, but it essentially allows the club a little bit of security if this agreement doesn't work out. And it also allows Mark Atanasio some agreement as well. And theoretically, there would be nothing stopping him from, say, Norwich City getting promoted, him you know, cashing in his his C preference shares um, when they're in the Premier League and making a profit on already what he's put in. Don't get the sense watching his interview, which I'm sure we'll get into, that that's the type of character that that he is and that's the way he views it. But theoretically, that would be an option as well. So I think it just adds a little bit of, of security for both parties as they maybe try and figure out in a little bit more detail maybe what the end goal is with this agreement, but also as they learn a bit more about each other as well. And obviously from the initial interviews that the club have put out, that all sounds relatively positive. So yeah, a little bit complex, probably a little bit dry to some people, but absolutely significant and um, and absolutely major in terms of Norwich City and the dynamic and the power structures at their club and in their boardroom at this moment in time. Yeah, before we touch on, on the interview that we obviously saw with Atanasio across the, the club's channels and Delia and Michael as well. And obviously we'll take your questions in the comments section below. So if you've got anything you want to ask us, that then get that down in the comments. But um, Connor, I'll come straight over to you again. Um, obviously, we know that Michael Folger is the man that's going to be stepping away. It's, it's his shares that have been purchased. Uh, and it was a really, really nice tweet from his son this morning, which I'll just read out. Um, the end of an era. Couldn't be more proud of the contribution that my father has made over the last 25, 26 years. It's been an incredible run. As he says, it's time for someone else to take up the challenge onward and upwards for the club, starting with tonight. So um, how do you reflect on on Michael Folger's time in that sort of 25-year period? Obviously, there's been lots of really big success, particularly given where the club were when he came in. Obviously, he sat alongside Michael and, Michael and Delia. And, you know, obviously, we saw the Wembley success. We've seen promotions to the Premier League. And ultimately, you can sort of look at that spell and say that it has been a really big period of time in Norwich City's history. Yeah, I think he's, he's probably a really underrated figure in it all, really. You, you look at, for example, the the impact and influence he made when when signing Grant Holt. That isn't a deal that Norwich City would have been able to complete without the money that that he injected into it. There's there's also been investments in terms of the academy and helping them out and um, just little bits and pieces behind the scenes that have made it, made a big impact in terms of making something happen or ensuring that something gets over the line. As you mentioned, in terms of length of service, he's He's been on the board alongside Delia and Michael since the day they stepped into it. So he's a, a massive confidant of them. Um, and he's obviously played a real role in moving Norwich City through the eras and, and through different different culture shifts and changes. And he's been someone that, that's had the trust of Delia Smith and, uh, and Michael Wynne-Jones for a long time since they've kind of propped up the football club. He's been a real figure um, in, in the Norwich City boardroom. So... Yeah, I, I don't think anyone should understate the influence that he has he has played in recent Norwich City history and, and the role that he's played and the importance of it as well. He's someone that is really respected behind the scenes, very popular, has played, as I said, a, a really important role in some massive things, no less the, the signing of Grant Holt, which fans will, will, will be really, will be really grateful for. So a really significant moment. I'm sure Norwich fans will wish him well and be grateful for the service that he's provided because that is a, a mega period of time particularly in football which moves so quickly and shifts and changes and is so fluid um, for someone to do 25 years in, in any job really is a, is a massive achievement but to do it in football is is incredible really and um, yeah I, I think his, his son's tweet probably captured it all probably at the right time for someone else to take on the challenge of trying to sustain Norwich City as a Premier League football club and obviously that's a collective effort um, but he, he clearly feels he's at a stage in his life and in his time where 
he can step away from it and, and probably step back into being a fan again. He's, he's going to take up a, a vice presidency role. He's obviously going to step away from the board at the end of the season. I would imagine that will create another space for, for someone um, of Atanasio's group to, to potentially come and join the board as well. So that would be another fresh face. And all of this, of course, he's he's done when he made clear he wanted to sell his shares. He, he involved the club in that process. He didn't need to do that. It was, it was a private transaction. He could have just gone away and sold them without really the consent of, of Delia and Michael um, and the club. He elected not to do that. And I think it, it, it's probably a testament to the relationship that he has with the majority shareholders that he opted to involve them in the process and essentially allow the club to go out and find the, the suitable person to take his shares and uh, and form a suitable plan as to what that would look like over the long term. So, um yeah, really important figure. When when we look back and uh, and talk about this period in Norwich City history, Michael Folger will be one of the the key players in it. I think, and um, yeah, I, I think Norwich fans will be extremely grateful for the service that he's provided and the funds he's provided over a really long period of time. Naturally, Sam, there's a lot of excitement and, and what this is going to bring for the for the future of Norwich City Football Club. But we know that you know Delia and Michael wanted it to be the right person. There's been a lot of you know, sort of time spent on this to make sure that the, the due diligence was done and it, you know, it was the right person coming in. So um, in terms of Mark Atanasio, obviously he's the owner of the Milwaukee Brewers baseball team and there's sort of a lot of similarities. If you look at his mission statement of, of that baseball team, it's there's four sort of elements to it. it. It's being a competitive team. It's all about the fan experience, being a leader in the community and obviously an organisation where people want to watch. And, and I feel like if you look at that interview that he's done with the club, a lot of the focus was around community. And we know that the Sports Foundation do some really, really great work across Norfolk and Norwich, you know, in terms of helping out those that are in need, you know, and obviously have their different disabilities and other issues. So that's a really you know important piece of work. So. How important do you feel that it is that they've obviously got this appointment done and it is Mark Atanasio that has these kind of values that do kind of align with those of Delia and Michael and the club? Yeah, and it's fairly lucky if you take Delia at her word in that interview she did with Club T Channels. She um, she said that basically it was the only serious proposal they've had. So the fact that somebody's come along with those um, twinned ideologies, I think Atanasio described it as eerie in his interview, how similar it was between... Norwich City and, and the Milwaukee Brewers so yeah it's very encouraging and I think most Norwich fans have been Norwich fans for their life and have got used to a certain way of running things will be very happy that things won't be changing too much as much as I'm sure plenty are uh, ambitious and they want to see the sorts of transformations that mean Norwich can spend big in the Premier League and can sustain themselves at that level I think the large majority will also want to still be able to relate to the identity that they've they've seen their football club as for the whole of their supporting life. And it doesn't feel like they're going to go particularly far away from that with Mark, Anasio, Mark Atanasio in and around the club. Um, that's sort of the debate now a lot of the time around the owners. And we've seen a lot of ethical things about almost um, sacrificing the community element and the ethical and moral element for the ability to spend and, and the ability to be better on the pitch. And I don't think Norwich is going to have to do that. So I think they'll be very pleased that they've managed to do that. It almost feels like that's been a dilemma Norwich, Norwich fans have been facing for decades, really. Do do they want investment? And the, the caveat has always been that if it does come, it's likely to be, you know, maybe a slightly unethical thing or they're going to have to go away from the football club that they've known for the whole of their lives. Thankfully, Norwich fans, although they're, they're not really technically making the decision, thankfully they don't have to face that that dilemma in terms of um you know whether they want the investment or not so i think it's it's good news for all parties it's obviously good news for atanasio in that it is a new venture for him he admitted in that interview he doesn't know too much about football and um he'll want certain guarantees that this is going to be a success and i think any football fan and any norwich fan that wants him to stick around will be pleased that the values of norwich city seem to align with what he wants to be a part of so much because you know in that sense you don't see him disagreeing with the likes of Delia and Michael and, and that fallout happening as perhaps it's happened previously when there's been minor investment that we think might turn into more and there's just been a, a disagreement or a, a slight difference in ideologies I don't think that's going to happen and thankfully they've put in lots of due, due diligence to ensure that this was the right person that was also part of the reason why Folger went through the club, you know, everyone will be aware he could have just sold it privately to absolutely anyone he wanted and Delia and Michael would have been stuck with that person. But 
he went through the club and allowed them to to make that decision. And that's allowed the likes of um, Anthony Richens, Stuart Webber, Zoe Ward to almost conduct a screening process and ensure the right person is going into the football club. So, you know, it's something we've been aware of since we broke that story. If you go through the Milwaukee Brewers website, I remember us having a look at their sort of ethos page and saying you could almost be reading this off the Norwich City website. So it's something we've been aware of for a long time. But that interview will really have reinforced the belief that Atanasio is the right man for Norwich and that his beliefs really fit those of, of Norwich and Norwich's fans. So I think that's that's good news for everyone. Yeah, there is a, a growing kind of interest from from overseas, particularly America, in English football. I mean, don't quote me, but I believe it's around about 14 of the 20 Premier League clubs have, have some sort of US element involved. So, Connor, what does this sort of look like? Obviously, a lot of those clubs have sort of got those kind of American owners where they've gone in and invested heavily in the playing squad. You know, obviously different. Obviously, they're not American, but Newcastle have seen that quite recently in terms of a lot of investment in their playing squads. I'm going to tie this into Alex's question on, on YouTube. Um is the investment going towards structural investment, aka the stadium training ground, or will it be on field investments? I, I'd probably say it's more the, the former than the latter. Yeah, I don't, I don't see Norwich suddenly going out and spending £200 million upon promotion. I, I don't see that being the case. Could I see Norwich in a position where they were last summer, for example, where they were probably just shy of getting a, a Christoph Iyer over the line? And, and could this prove the difference in terms of that? Absolutely. I could, I could see that being the case. Or maybe where there was a a, a few million gap that prevented them from signing players. I is a good example, Philip Billing, perhaps another to throw in that category. I could now see this being a situation where they're probably now provided with those funds to get those deals over the line, calculated risks, as as uh, Mark Atanasio said. But I, I think a lot of what you will see will come from the off-pitch elements. Um, Delia and Michael spoke a lot about kind of the database that they have and that they've established at the Brewers. And I think that's the case for a lot of baseball. My, my baseball knowledge is severely limited. Um, so I, I could be speaking majorly out of turn. But my understanding is that there's a very good data system in, in baseball. And that's used a lot for terms of recruitment. And uh, Moneyball was was baseball originally, right? So so it's, it's that kind of element. And that is obviously where Norwich City will strive to make the gains. They've appointed a data team recently in this area. Uh, they've obviously got the South American element as well to open up that and and obviously the, the relationship with Coritiba so they can tap into kind of their database. So all of this is building an impact or, or, or a clear picture rather of, of where Norwich City want to go. They want to be very good on data. They've sort of realigned their recruitment team now. The head of recruitment and, and people underneath him are, are very data-based rather than perhaps being traditional scouts, conventional scouts in, in kind of that aspect. So it will have a major impact in terms of the way they recruit players. Um, structurally, you mentioned Cara Road. That they're obviously now looking into the, the possibility of extending the, the city stand. They need to do that in the next decade. Um, it is the type of thing that Atanasio now could provide an, an, an injection of funds to do. Uh, he spoke about, obviously, the training ground and, and there's still a, a plan to improve that beyond where we are. Uh, obviously, the, the recovery hub is going up at the moment. They want to improve that further with, with various different in, investments and building up. So I think what you will see in, in the short term is probably a little bit of a change upon uh, upon getting back into the Premier League in terms of recruitment. But I don't see fundamentally the Norwich City model changing because, again, Atanasio spoke about sustainability, the importance of it, and how he, he isn't just, you know, win at all costs. It actually has to be a process and you have to build it up. Well, it wasn't too dissimilar to listening to Stuart Webber speak or to, to listening to Delia and Michael speak. And I think the reason that Norwich City haven't had major offers to come and take control of the football club from powerful individuals is because actually the threshold is so high that Delia and Michael place on it that you have to be a very specific type of person. And the fact that Asanasio has cleared all those hurdles and we are where we are today, I think should provide real com comfort to Norwich City fans that actually th this is a good egg, so to speak, in terms of footballing aspects. It's not someone who's going to completely rip up what they have at the moment. It's probably just injecting a bit more cash into the current setup and into the current model they have and providing maybe the small aspects around the side or the few million more that make Premier League survival a realistic, you know, a realistic viable thing. Whereas at the moment, and, and you only have to look at the history of their performance at that level, that actually in the current model, it, it doesn't look possible to survive as a Premier League team. I think it's all about adding the bits around the edges and maybe adding a few million here and there in different parts of the football club in the short term, whilst the, this model is as it is, that will give them that. And then obviously, once they become, if they become a Premier League sustained team, the opportunities then for both them, for Atanasio, for Delia and Michael, 
are enormous and, and that attracts a whole different type of people and you can take it in a completely different direction as as he has done with the Brewers as well. It's not been, I'm going to throw £200 million at it and we're going to win everything in baseball. That's not the case. It's been gradual. It's been um, sort of phased. It's been actually continuity a lot of the time, him appointing people in positions to do the jobs that they're employed to do. Um, and that's, I think, what we will see more. So whilst things are changing, I also expect quite a lot to stay the same. And um, I think probably what, we're, what we've said and what we've said throughout this process is what it was never going to be was a radical departure from where Norwich City are at this moment under Delia and Michael. It was always going to be probably a phased um, approach or an addition to what they have at this moment in time. So in, in response to that question, you know, it doesn't feel to me like we're going to see Norwich break a, a £20 million pound, you know, barrier for new signings, but actually it will just be the bits around the edges that maybe the improve they feel the improvements will be needed to get them to the level to where they need to be. So it, it is different in that regard, but it's not a complete reshuffle in terms of what they are as a football club, which is interesting and probably sensible and pragmatic, uh, I think, compared to perhaps some changes in, in ownership and, uh, and when extra investment arrives into a football club. Yeah, Connor's just spoken there at length about sort of the short-term implications, Sam. So in terms of the long-term, obviously we can't be naive and, and kind of neglect the age of Delia and Michael. There will become a point where you know somebody else is going to have to take the majority. So what does this sort of initial investment that Mark Atanasio has put into the football club mean for the long-term future of Norwich City Football Club? Do you think that he could eventually go on to to take the sort of the majority? I mean, it's a good question, and we don't want to speculate too much, but it's certainly a possibility. What it feels like, as we've been saying since sort of a couple of weeks after we broke the story when it started to become clear that this would be a minority shareholding and it would be Michael Folger's shares um, that it would centre around is that this looks like the sort of first steps and the ability to say, you know, this is what I am and and for him to learn. He spoke a lot about learning about football, actually, and it gives him an opportunity to learn. But in future, you know, he's the man, let's be totally honest, he's got the funds to... To, to, to do that if that's something that he wants to do as you said Delia and Michael were getting on a little bit I think Michael actually referenced that in the the interview and it will be something that they're thinking about it's probably something they've been thinking about for a long time now um, and it does look like a, a potential solution if in the next few years um, this is something that, that Atanasio and Norwich want to continue with um, I think the seven year period is a very interesting one I think when we come towards the end of that that'll be something to keep an eye on, although the fact that there are obviously those clauses in there that mean certain events will trigger the possibility to to have those ordinary shares or to have that um, that sort of loan back with interest. I think that is going to be an interesting period to see what happens then, because if it gets to seven years and it's, it's sort of quietly, um, you know, put in the background, then it doesn't feel like that is going to happen. But if we get there, there probably is a serious discussion to be had over how much further he wants to go um, with the club. I think obviously we've, we've, um, we've spoken about how he's been sort of buying up smaller shares and, and that's um, something that they referenced in the the announcement that it's not only Folgers. So he's he's obviously not just settling on this one, one set of shares from Michael Folger and he is exploring other possibilities and uh, he wasn't directly asked the question as you wouldn't expect him to in that interview but I'm sure if he would have been asked and he gave a candid answer it would have been that he was open to the possibility potentially if all the planets aligned to owning Norwich City um, in the future and from from a financial point of view that would be a, a significant uplift from where the current majority shareholders are but if you look at a list on the Premier League I think he would still be something like 17th compared to the rest of the owners in that league so it's not exactly even if that did happen and we're talking a lot of steps away now it's not going to be a, a Newcastle or Manchester City style overhaul it would as Connor um, sort of spoke about it would be a, a slightly more subtle overhaul I think so it will be interesting to see how that situation develops it's probably something to keep an eye on how the, the smaller shares go in the next few years. Um, but it's probably going to be a slow burner before we see that. I don't see it getting to the end of the season. And Mark Atanasio is the, the owner of Norwich City Football Club. But right here and now, all the noises suggest that it could be something in the future. And, you know, let's be frank, the, the transfer of shares isn't a, a particularly exciting subject. And I don't think we see a 33-minute a interview with the man that's doing that unless 
the club views it as something that's very exciting and going to, to transform things. So, yeah, I think in the future it's a possibility, but um, yeah, probably safe on our end not to, to speculate as to a yes or no right now. Inevitably, Connor, there will be a bit of a shift of conversation about what this will mean for Norwich City in, in the Premier League. We know that they've notoriously struggled for, for quite a few years now to, to actually go up to the Premier League and establish themselves. So there's a bit of a question here for, from Tom. Um, hi, guys. If we got promoted, do you feel that Atanasio would help increase the club's wage structure, for example, or obviously have an input in terms of funds? We kind of covered the latter part there. But in terms of the, the wage structure, how would you feel that this would impact that? Possibly. I, I think it's it's maybe a bit of a, a non-starter anyway, because in many ways, if you if you go up to the Premier League, you, you have to increase your wage structure as any club because you have to be competitive and that's the only way you can be competitive so um, that would happen if Norwich got promoted under the current ownership without Mark Atanasio um, on board so you know again you can only speculate at, at this stage but you know he spoke in, in the video and actually the, the section that I found really interesting was when he spoke about kind of his early years at the Brewers and, and um, he, he phrased it as they do in American sports as kind of increasing the payroll and actually how maybe some of the community elements got lost behind that. And it wasn't until his wife maybe said, look, are we going to do anything with the charity that um, they, they, they may be caught up on that aspect. But that shows that he is someone who is willing to provide the funds um, to increase the payroll in American terms, the wage bill, as, as we probably refer to it over here. Um, so I, I don't think it's any, something that we can rule out. We can't also definitively sit here and say, you know, similarly with with the the investment and the funding that he's going to provide loads more funds. As I said, I I, don't, I just don't foresee that. What what I see is, you know, maybe if there's if Norwich are a couple of million here and they're short on a player or or in the budget or whatever, he may well top it up in this current position to to help them out a little bit. Um, if that if that is what Stuart Webber maybe feels is is the difference, um, or a, or Dean Smith maybe even a player is the difference. So. Again, I don't see materially Norwich going out and spending the type of money that other Premier League clubs have this summer. Um, but I think it would make them more competitive in the top flight. Yeah, and I, I guess that crucially, when we when we speak about investment and we can boil it down to whatever we like, that's the thing that, that supporters want to know. How does it impact the team? Will it improve it? Are they going to spend more on transfers? Are they going to run the football club? These are the key questions that, that people want to know ultimately, rather than perhaps percentages and, and whose shares he's bought. So... Ultimately, we're going to have to wait a little bit longer for, for answers to those questions. Um, but, you know, what's what's interesting again for me is the relationships that he he has. And he spoke about it at length in the video again, spoke about the the, the Fenway group who own Liverpool quite a lot and um, how he feels that they've got a lot of the same resources at the Brewers um, that maybe the Fenway group have used in terms of incorporating some of what the Red Sox do. Um, and what Liverpool take from the Red Sox, he he, he sees those elements. Um, there was also a reference, of course, to the ones who have just um, brought in at, at AC Milan. He also said he spoke to to Richard Scudamore, former Premier League chief executive, which is um, which is really interesting as well. So this is clearly someone who's trying to create relationships in this space, and um, really interesting as well. I know we haven't mentioned it, but he said right at the start about the involvement in the club. It's no surprise to me that that came via someone, of course, who who prob probably was involved at Liverpool. And you only need to look on Norwich City's board of directors for, for a certain uh, executive director who who had a spell at Liverpool. So there's a natural connection there to make. So, yeah, it, it, it's all really interesting. And I think he probably himself is sat waiting to see exactly how it transpires. And also Delia and Michael as well, which is why there is this nice safety net created by the C preference shares and the way that they've structured it so they can fully establish what it looks like. And Delia and Michael made reference to learning from him as much as them learning from for, uh, from him learning from them sorry so um, it's going to be fascinating I think we're all really intrigued and interested to see how it pans out and how it plays out from here but ultimately it's a different kettle of fish where Norwich City gets to the Premier League and who knows this may be the difference they spoke so much about marginal gains and, and how they feel it's probably subtle small changes that need to be made for Norwich City to become a uh, an established top flight club if that is such a thing um, if it isn't you know, we could, there's probably another debate in itself whether you can ever establish yourself fully as a top flight club. Um, but I think it's really exciting. I think Norwich fans will feel really excited by it. And uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting from here and now to see the differences that, that are made in, in both the short term and also the long term. Yeah, exactly that. We'll be we live for about another five or 10 minutes. So if you've got any last questions, get them down in the comment section below and we'll try and get around to them. Um, Sam, 
Another comment from Alex here. Uh, will the C shares investment be a one-time investment uh, or can we expect to see more investment in the club? Upon reaching the Premier League, I sort of know you've done a little bit of research into this, so I'm going to put you on the spot and see if you can answer that. Well, in terms of the C preference shares, it, they expire on the 31st of December this year, so it's impossible that investment would come from that exact avenue um, if Norwich were in the Premier League next season. But I think, you know, the idea is potentially that he will invest money in the football club and probably being in the Premier League as a as much as he talked about it being a passion rather than an investment. Um, you know, he is somebody who probably wants to see that investment grow and to see the asset that he's now part of grow and as somebody who's been involved in money as a career for most of his life, he'll understand that once he's in the Premier League, it's probably in his interests to potentially top the club up and help them succeed at that level. Because if he can do that, the asset that Atanasio now owns part of absolutely rockets in in price and value. So if they do go up, I do see him investing. Um, probably it won't come through C preference shares, but it's definitely a possibility and it does increase if they're in the Premier League, not only because of that, element that like I said in terms of the the increasing value but also because once you're in the Premier League you, you have to really you look at Nottingham Forest um, and I'm sure Norwich won't be spending to to, those, to that degree but you get to the Premier League and that's just what you do unfortunately these days and I'm not saying I agree with that but that's what every every club has done that's what Norwich tried to do to an extent um, last year they tried to get around the fact that they didn't have that investment by selling their best player and obviously that gamble didn't come off but I think they will have to find the money from somewhere if they get promoted and they will have to have a real go in the transfer market. I see it in a similar way as the Connor in terms of maybe they won't have to shy out of those deals for the likes of Christopher Iyer and um, Philip Billing in future because of this. But I don't see it being like a, a huge... They go up to the Premier League, Atanasio says, here's £150 million, pounds, do what you want. Um, I just think he may well top them up once they get to that, that sort of level. It, I think they've proven in the Championship and this is why... People are probably asking about promotion to the Premier League and investment upon that achievement because they've proven this year that they can spend quite a lot by championship standards, even within the fully self-funded model. They spent reportedly £10 million on Gabriel Sarra if all those clauses are met. Marcelino Nunez was over £3 million, which in the championship, especially given the current market, is a huge amount of money. So, you know, I don't think they necessarily need, obviously, I'm sure they wouldn't turn it down, but they don't really need that investment in the championship. I think perhaps they'll then ask for it a little bit more if they're promoted to the Premier League. Yeah, obviously going back to May, Connor, we, we went through an identification process in terms of the group that was pictured by our, our brilliant photographer, Paul Chesterton, uh, at that Tottenham game. They were all sat in the director's box area. So um, Callum Goodley has asked the question, do we know what slash who the group led by Atanasio consists of? Well, there was sort of a, a collective of those that were at Cow Road that, that day in May. Yeah, well, one of them is is Richard Resler, who is uh, a close friend of Mark Atanasio. Sam's done an excellent piece on on the Pink and Plus app, which uh, I think he's he's linked on his on his Twitter. But you could also go and find it um, back from from around this story broke. They've they've been best friends, I think, for about forty years. Um, he is he's worth reportedly a hundred million dollars. So uh, yeah, we we await to see who else is behind that. But again, not too dissimilar to what what he has at the Brewers, where. He is principal owner, but he has a, a series of people underneath him and, uh, and also with the ice hockey team that he's, he's, he's part uh, owner of as well. So um, I, I think increasingly we're seeing a guy who likes to build partnerships and likes to have relationships, business and personal with with other people. And, you know, he's entered a, obviously a new one with, with Delia and Michael as, as well as the rest of the shareholders at, at Norwich City. So this isn't like out of character for him. Um, no, so, so we await details exactly of, of what that consortium looks like and, and, and who exactly is involved. And I guess the most interesting one for people will be how much that is potentially worth. But even with, with Atanasio and Reslo, you're looking at £800 million there as a, as a duo, which is um, a staggering amount of money, um, really, uh, and certainly superior to, to, to what Norwich City have at this moment in time. So um, that's going to be interesting. Um, you know, interesting, he, he said again, that, that Rick Scheslinger, who again is in a senior position with, with the Brewers, I think he's, you boys might have to help me out, commercial lead or, or something along those lines, something in the commercial department that he, he was a part of this deal as well. Another one who was spotted at, at Carroll Road, uh, he said his son, um, who also has a role with the Brewers, but he's also his son, um, was, was on a Zoom call in kind of those very uh, exploratory um, 
moments where, where they were chatting with with Norwich executives. So so all of this kind of paints the picture that there is a, a group behind Atanasio involved in this, um, you know, Resla being one of them. So he, he's the one that we know here and now. And, uh, and I'm sure as we get into to maybe things being confirmed and, uh, you know, things being watertight, which uh, I suspect they will be by the end of September, we'll begin to be able to to give a proper answer on, on who these people are kind of um, behind Atanasio. But he's the head of it. He's the face. He's the one that Norwich City fans will will see and hear about. And he is the one who, you know, again, we're speculating theoretically, um, we'll, we'll use that term, if it was to get to a stage where this consortium became the sole owners of Norwich City and there's no indication that that's going to be the case in the short term, as we've outlined, and probably have to keep reiterating because I think that's probably a natural assumption to maybe jump at, but that's not the case at the moment. If that was ever to be the case, it would be Mark Atanasio heading it up as he does with the Brewers. So um, he is the main one that I think Norwich City fans will need to concern themselves with. But uh, but yeah, as of now, we don't know who who who's in that group, how many of them there are. All of we know, all we know is that they've set up a company to be involved in that. And uh, again, we we wait for further, further details on on that. And uh, yeah, you're quite right. Just uh, to cap off, to give a, a huge credit to, to Paul Chesterton, uh, I've seen some various uh, theories as to how that story was acquired, and it's not quite maybe as as fortuitous as as some will have you believe. I think there was a lot more work into it than than perhaps people would imagine. So. That's worth stressing as well, but the picture was was an important piece in the jigsaw. So, uh, yeah, we we've uh, we certainly owe Paul, who I'm sure will watch this at some point, uh, uh, a tipple of his choice. I think for the role that he played in in that story because it was a, a really important one. The round off, Sam. You've done a sort of piece on the pink and just harvesting a bit of fan reaction. So, obviously, we've got a match tonight, which I think we all kind of forget when news like this breaks. Um, so, do you feel like, like this is going to feed into that atmosphere tonight? Do you think we're going to get sort of a, a really bouncing car road that's going to be excited, sort of based off this news and also Norwich City flying in the championship, as we all know? Yeah, should be, um, especially given they've had 11 days away from watching their team as well. They should be sort of feverishly excited. And it's that, that nice balance now between it's not really the routine to win because they've had that break and it's not just I think at the Coventry game um drumming aside there was maybe a bit a bit of a sense of routine about it and like a because Norwich was such huge favourites I don't think there was a, a requirement for a massive atmosphere whereas now not only are Norwich coming up against you know with all due respect to Coventry some probably more serious competition in Bristol who are fourth in the championship at the moment they're also probably not backed by that momentum that they had and it's it's probably a bit more in the balance so I think Norwich will be desperate to have that atmosphere behind them and it's probably worked out particularly well for them that this this has been announced this morning um I wonder if how much intention was behind that I would say potentially a, a decent amount um and I think we actually got a similar investment a similar announcement didn't we ahead of a game I think it was a, a midweek game earlier in the season they made an announcement around Atanasio so uh, yeah it's a pattern we're seeing and it's probably quite a clever pattern if they want to get the fans behind them at Carrow Road I will say the Barkley has been fantastic in the last few games um, it'll be interesting to see if they've got the drum there but yeah uh, it's going to be a, an exciting one to to gauge the the atmosphere but right now I'll probably need another two or three hours before I can actually feel like today's a, a match day given how much we've already sort of discussed um, and already gone into apart from the match today. So, yeah, it's been a very busy day. They've got. They've also got the chance to go, I think it's four points clear of third already at this 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 early stage. That's not really been discussed much, but that's that's an incredible gap to have considering, in my view, we've we've not seen a full 90-minute performance um, from Norwich City yet and, and it probably still feels like there's more to give as well. So that opportunity should be enough, I think, to, to get Carrow Road lifted because if they were to build that cushion even at this stage of the season, um, it would be it would be pretty pretty important, I think, and, uh, and it's a pretty statement. And it, it already would look like, maybe even if that, this isn't the case, and Dean Smith would certainly be keen to distance um, these suggestions, but it would already look like there's kind of a top two that's beginning to move away from the pack and Norwich City ultimately want to be involved in that. And they would be. So a win is important in that regard. Bristol City going well, um, in really good form. Some excellent players. Conway up front is on fire. Um, so I don't think it's, it's going to be a run-of-the-mill championship affair that Norwich need to turn up and win um, and, and they'll win. I think it'll probably be a bit more complex than that. So yeah, a big big football match tonight as well. Um, but I'm sure we'll, we'll hear some chance of USA and, uh, and if Josh Sargent can cap off the night and make it a particularly American themed one as he did on the last one. And I'm sure we'll have a bit of uh, maybe not born by the uh, born. What is it? What's the, what's the song? Um, 
Bruce Born Springsteen. Born that's in the USA, yeah. that's um, if we maybe not that one, but but maybe one with an American flavor uh, towards the end, that would be nice, wouldn't it, to cap off uh, what is a momentous day in terms of American investment in Norwich City Football Club. I'm just hoping it is hot dogs for dinner tonight at, at Carrow Road to, to really mark the American aspect. Um, whether the drummer's there tonight or not, we don't know, but I can confirm all three of us will be at Carrow Road this evening for all your usual match coverage across the Pinkin and the Pinkin Plus app for, for everything you need to know. Obviously, we've also got all the Atanasio stuff across our channels at the moment, so if there's anything that you, you want to know, then that's probably the place to head. We've also got the Dean Smith press conference. If you haven't you know, watched that from yesterday, then, then go over there because that's um, got some really, really nice tributes towards uh, the late Queen Elizabeth II, which obviously that will be a minute silence followed by the national anthem tonight. So that should be a, a really moving moment. Um, Connor's going to throw it back over to you. Score prediction. You weren't on the preview show yesterday with me and Sam. So um, go on, put one in. Ooh, I, I think we're going to be, I think it's going to be quite a high scoring game tonight because um, Bristol City have quite a good attack, but can't really defend on the evidence that I've seen. And Norwich also can see quite a lot of high quality chances as well for all the talk and rightly so that their, their defensive duo has got. So I, I could, I'll, I'll throw one in here. I'm not going to go with it, but I'll just throw it in here. I could see a free two in probably either direction. Um, but I, I think Norwich will probably win more comfortably than that. I, I think it'll probably be a, a two, two nil. I think they'll keep another clean sheet. Yeah, I went free two yesterday on the preview show. So uh, Did you? there you go. Great, great minds, mate. Great minds. It's exactly that. I think that will round off the show. Thanks for joining us this lunchtime. As I said, all our match coverage will be available this evening. So head over there um, and say all the usual coverage. So, so thanks for joining us. Enjoy the the, you know, the game tonight, and let's hope Josh Sargent can cap off a very momentous day in Norwich City's history. <laughs>